Good afternoon. Right, I'm going to earn. I'm just going to wait three minutes so that others can join and then we begin. This should be for about two hours. It's not a, it's not a, no, this one is not Zoom, as in, I'm just streaming it. All right, I'm going to begin now. So just to do a check, are you hearing me clearly? You can just text in the comment section if you are hearing me clearly. Okay, good. All right, so this session, we're going to do questions involving alkanes, alkenes, some alcohols, aldehydes, and a little calculation with combustion analysis. So the first question that you are looking at now, it's from 2022, sorry, 2021. All right, and we're going to start with ice summarizing. So we all know what structural isomerism is, right? All right, let me just put it. So we know it's a type of isomerism. In which compounds of the same molecular formula, but different structural formula. Just going to put SF for structural formula. All right, so there are three types of structural isomerism. So the three types. So the question now it is moving on. It is asking us to identify two types of structural isomers and give an example of each. So we have three types. We have chain. Positional isomerism and functional group. So 
So let me just get a little space and we will do them. So it is asking us to identify two types. So I'm going to do this, three of them, and give examples. The live will be saved and available to watch afterwards. So for chain ice homerism, this one, all right, this is the one you would have been familiar with from CSEC. So the example I'm going to use is pentane, C5H12. And from pentane, you could drop, you could write pentane. So pentane, C5H12, it has three isomers. We have pentane, you can have two methyl, butane, and you can have two, two, dimethyl, propane. The reason why, so with the chain ice summarism, the arrangement of the atoms must be different. How you connect the carbon atoms, it must be different. That is what happens in chain ice summarism. So for example, with pentane, you have all the five carbons connected to each other. No. If you do this, that is still pentane. So with chain ice summarism, the connectivity must be different. If we should label this as carbon A and this as carbon B, looking at the two compounds, they may look different, but in reality, the connectivity is the same because this would be carbon A, and this would be carbon B. So in this compound, A is connected to B. The same thing appears here. So even though the shape is different, the connection is not. So it's not to draw a different shape. The connectivity of the atoms must be different. So what you should do is remove carbon B, right? Now, if I come out here and put carbon B out here, so let me put it in blue, all right? If I put it out here, obviously, you are getting the same compound. You should do this. It is no different. All five carbon atoms are connected to each other, all right? So if you want to draw a chain ice summers, you are going to draw it in a straight line first, all of the atoms in the pump. Then you're going to remove the one at the end. So your new isomer, it must have four carbons in the chain, right? Carbon B in blue, you should not put it back on any of the carbons at the end. Do not put it on any carbons at the end. It should go on one of these in the middle. If you do that, you are changing the connection. So in this one, all five carbon atoms are in the same chain. And in this one, you only have four carbon atoms in the chain. Of course, you will put on your hydrogens, right? So. You would have to put on your hydrogen. All right. And so this compound is pentane. And this one here, you have four carbon atoms in the chain. So that makes it butane. And move this carbon from here and put it below. So this would be your methyl group. So you have a methyl group on carbon two. So that would make it two methyl butane. 
right? So this is chain isomerism. You want to take a screenshot of the board? You can go ahead now, and we're going to look at positional isomerism. All right, so at this point, I'm going to erase the screen, erase the board. So in terms of answering this question, Type of isomerism chain example. Pentane. Two metal butane. Next one now. Functional group. Example, ethanol, dimethyl, ether. All right. So for the pentane, both of them would have the molecular formula C5H12, pentane and 2-methyl butane. Right, so I'm going to scroll down again, and we're going to actually see how we get the, the ethanol and dimethyl ether. Right, so you can take a screenshot again if you need the answers. All right, so with functional group isomerism now, so with any form of isomerism, you have to start out with the molecular formula. So both compounds have to have the same molecular formula. But with functional group isomerism, the two compounds, they must have a different functional group. If you're on the exam and you get a molecular formula, with carbon, hydrogen, and one oxygen. A carbon, hydrogen, and one oxygen. It could be four things. It could be alcohol. It could be ether. It could be aldehyde. Aldehyde. Or it could be ketone. All right. No, if we should do a general formula to match this molecular formula here, right? This would be Cn H2n plus 2O. All right. For your, let us do the aldehyde and the ketone. So this is the structure for propanol, right? Which is a ketone. Let us do propanol. If you should check the amount of hydrogens present, that will be three and two, five and two, seven and one, 
8. So an alcohol, if it has three carbons, it will have eight hydrogens. That is for your alcohol. But your ketone, if it has three carbons, if it has three carbons, it will only have six hydrogens. So with the alcohol, it's 2N plus two in terms of hydrogen. But with the ketone, it is CNH2N. I hope you are getting this. So for your ketone, the amount of hydrogen present is twice the amount of carbon. But for your alcohol, the amount of hydrogen present is twice the amount of carbon plus two more. All right. So automatically, when you get the compound with one oxygen, you can use the amount of hydrogen to know if you should get an alcohol or you can do aldehyde and ketone. Good. So with this particular example here, because the number of hydrogen is twice the amount of carbon plus two more. So two, two is four, four and two is six. We're going to use alcohol and ether. Right. That means for the aldehyde, because we don't have any carb, we don't have any ketone with two carbons. Let me erase this. If it was an aldehyde with two carbons, you would have four hydrogen. Right. So C2H6O, you can draw an alcohol and you can draw an ether for your functional group isomerism. If it was C2H4O, you would draw an aldehyde. But let me not use C2 because we would need a ketone. All right. So C3H6O, that is when you would draw the aldehyde and ketone. So you cannot have an alcohol with three, with three carbons and just six hydrogen, all right? So what I'm pointing out here, you can get molecular formula to draw functional group isomerism. If you see one oxygen in the compound, it can be alcohol or it can, and ether or aldehyde and ketone. So just use the amount of hydrogen to tell you that, all right? So let us do the actual positional isomer, sorry, functional group. P2H6O, I am going to draw ethanol. Right? And I'm going to draw the ether. For the ether, you have an oxygen in the middle, single bonded to two carbons, all right? So once you see this, that is an ether. Oxygen in the middle, single bonded to two other carbons. And we know that carbon always form four bonds. So these two examples are for functional group isomerism. So clearly you have two different functional groups. All right, but they have the same molecular formula. So with chain isomerism, you are changing the arrangement of the carbon atoms. With, with functional group, you must get two different functional groups. For this question, all right, I'm just, at this point, I'm re replying to a comment from the, I'm replying to a comment asking if we can write out 
Yes, if you prefer to draw it or name it, whichever you prefer. It said give example. So if you want to draw the examples or you want to name it. All right, so I'm going to clear the screen at this point and do an example of positional isomerism. That one is the easiest one, actually. So with positional isomerism, you are simply moving the position of a functional group or a substituent group. So for example, so we are doing positional isomerism now. So this would be one propanol. So all I'm going to do is move the position of the OH group. By the way, if you put it here, this would still be one propanol. Right, and this is two propanol. So that's all you're doing. You are not changing the arrangement of the carbon atoms. You are just moving the, the functional group that is on it. You don't have to be a functional group. It could be a, a substituent group. So for example, This would be two bromo butane. So all I'm going to do is move the position of the BR. And right, so this is two bromo butane and one bromo. Butane. All right, so that is positional isomerism. So you can go ahead again if you need a screenshot, you can take it. I'm going to erase. And the point earlier, in terms of the oxygen, if you get two, if the compound, if the molecular family get, as in two oxygen, or functional group isomerism, if it has two oxygen in it, they are going to draw carboxylic acid and ester, all right? So if it has in two oxygen, you will draw carboxylic acid and ester for your functional group isomer. All right, let me just do a quick example. So this is functional group isomerism with two oxygens. All right, so that's C4, Trento, Fermento, 7, H8, O2.
esto Let us check if it adheres to the molecular formula. The so four carbons, three and two, five and three, that's eight hydrogens. Just dry it out. All right, so once you get a molecular formula with two oxygen, just draw a carboxylic acid and an ester. It could be any ester. It don't have to be two carbon on each side. All right, so I'm just pointing out two oxygens, carboxylic acid, and ester. All right. All right, so time to do the calculation now. Are you able to to read the are you able to read the question? I'm not sure if you're able to see it properly. All right, so it says a gaseous hydrocarbon P with a volume of 10 cm cube. So the hydrocarbon it has a volume of 10 cm cube. It was mixed with 70 cm cube of oxygen. So basically, what we're doing here is combustion. I know combustion, you're reacting your hydrocarbon with excess oxygen. And we know that the products of combustion is carbon dioxide and water. So after that reaction occurred, it says that the gaseous mixture remaining as a volume of 55 cm cube. So in combustion, you are using excess oxygen, which means that not all of the oxygen will be used up. So the 55 cm cube of gas that is remaining after the reaction, this 55 it represents unreacted oxygen plus CO2. All right. So after the reaction is completed, the gas remaining, it is the CO2 plus the unreacted oxygen. But to do this calculation, we need to know exactly how much CO2 was produced. So in the question, they will make mention of using either sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. So they said, after shaking with aqueous sodium hydroxide, the volume was reduced to 35. So after the reaction was completed, at 55 cm cube of gas. This was decreased to 35 cm cube after we added sodium hydroxide. What the sodium hydroxide is doing is removing the CO2. So if you add 55 after the reaction, and when you add sodium hydroxide, it reduced to 35. Remember, the sodium hydroxide is going to remove CO2. So that means 20 cm cube of CO2 was removed. So if it dropped from 55 to 35, it means that we would have removed 
20 cm cube of CO2. All right. So the volume of CO2 produced, so volume of CO2 is 20. All right. So to do this question also, you need to know the exact amount of oxygen that reacted. So the amount of oxygen that reacted it is going to be the total amount, which was 70 minus the unreacted amount, which would have been the 35. So the total after the reaction was 55. 20 of that was CO2. That means the remaining 35 is O2. Right, so this is how you have to piece together the information. You know the amount of hydrocarbon we use, you need to get the amount of CO2. Now we know it is 20. Now we need to figure out the exact amount of oxygen that actually reacted, which is going to be 35 CMQ. All right. So this is O2 that reacted. So I will give you a little time to take this off and then we'll continue with the question. All right, I'm going to continue now. All right, so we know CO2 is 20. We know that O2 is 35. And we know that the hydrocarbon is 10. All right, so the hydrocarbon, this is the equation, and we are trying to figure out the molecular formula of the hydrocarbon. So the hydrocarbon is in the form CXHY. So the equation is CXHY plus X plus Y over 4 O2 to give X. CO2 plus Y over 2 H2O. Do not let the X plus Y over 4 scale, it. it's just a mixed fraction. So, first thing we're going to do is put these values under the compound. So, 10 cm cube of hydrocarbon, 35 cm cube of oxygen, and 20 cm cube of CO2. Once you do it like this, you are going to divide by the smallest number of the three, all right? So 10 divided by 10, that is one. 35 divided by 10, we don't use decimals, so you write three and a half. 20 divided by 10 is two. So in this reaction, we use one mole of our hydrocarbon. So one mole of the hydrocarbon to produce two moles of CO2. And I'm going to erase the X plus Y over four for a minute, all right? So we use one mole of hydrocarbon, three and a half moles of oxygen, to produce two moles of CO2, all right? This is what we know. 
I'm going to erase the y over two for hydrogen, for, for water, all right? So if we ignore the x and the y and just balance it like a normal equation, the only thing that is left to balance, all right, we need to balance the carbon here. So if you use one mole of carbon to give two moles of CO2, any amount of carbon that is over here, that is what you should have in the compound. So if one mole of hydrocarbon produced two carbons over here, that means it was C2, all right? And then now you are going to work out the amount of oxygen. So on this side, three and a half times two, so three and a half times two, that would be a total of seven atoms of oxygen, which means that on the product side, you must also have seven atoms of oxygen. Now you cannot interfere with CO because based on our calculation, we produce two moles of CO2. So we are not going to interfere with this number. You can only put a number here. So if we know that the total we are supposed to get is seven, we look at how much is in CO2 and take it away from the seven. So two times two, that would give you four, right? That means you would need three more to give you seven. So that means you should have a three here. So the balanced equation, okay, we leave out Y. So let's figure out how much hydrogen is needed. On the product side, hydrogen is only in water. And we know that two times three, that is six. So the amount of hydrogen is six. All right, so our balanced equation is that one mole of ethane reacts with three and a half moles of oxygen to produce two moles of carbon dioxide and three moles of water. So that is our balanced equation. Now, they're just trying to make it a little more challenging by putting x plus y over four and the y over two, all right? So let us work it now in terms of x plus y over four. We here, C2, remember where we have the two, right? That was x. So x was here and x was here. Remember, for CO2, this is the mole of CO2. And the number that I would put here, that represents x x is equal to two. That is what we know so far. So x is two, all right? So we know x is two. How can we figure out what y is? After you figure out how much carbon is present, you are going to work out how much oxygen is present. Now, we know that we should have three and a half oxygen over here, right? And we should have a total of seven oxygen on this side. And to have this seven on this side, you would need three moles of water. The question do not want you to write three. What they want is y over two. Let me, all right, so the question wants, it wants y over two. Now, since we know that we should get three moles of water, y over two must equal to three because we must get three moles of water. They want it in terms of a fraction y over two. So it begs a simple question. 
what number, when you divide it by two, you will get three. And the answer to that is six. So y has to be six. Six divided by two is three. So y over two, it would be six divided by two. So remember, they could have easily just allowed you to put the three in front of it, but they choose to be a little more difficult and put y over two. So instead of having three here, it would be six over two. Now we know what y is, y is six. That is why we have six here. Now remember for oxygen, in terms of the equation, they had written x plus y over four. That means x plus x plus y over four should equal to three and a half. Now we know that x is two. So x is two, and we know that y is six. If you do your calculation. Six over four, six over four is equal to one and a half. So two plus one and a half is the same as three and a half. So two plus six over four is the same as three and a half. So in my equation, where I have three and a half, it will be two plus six divided by Four. Okay. So that is how we would work this type of question involving volume of gas. Before 2021, the next question like this, it was in 2016. It is also on the channel. You can go in the playlist and look for unit two past paper, it is titled something like that. All right, if you have any question, just type it in the comment section. Let me see if I can help you. So at this point, if any of you have any question, you can ask it and I will help you. All right, so let's move on now to the next question. So it's so the molecular formula of hydrocarbon P is C2H6. So this is what we just calculated, C2H6. So If you need to take a screenshot, you can do so now. Let me just put it back. All right, so if you need a screenshot of the working out, you can go ahead and take it. It's not really 
B, it's not really long. It's it's because I'm explaining it. So it shouldn't take a like it shouldn't take three minutes. It's actually it's not long. Right. So it's once you practice it, it will become easier. But it's probably because I'm taking the time to explain it, it will seem long. But it's actually sharp. All right, so we know that C2H6, that is propane. And then now they want us to outline the reaction mechanism for the reaction of P with Br2. All right, so we know that they are talking about free radical substitution. We're going to do free radical substitution. And we know that the first step is initiation. So in step one, that is initiation. And in initiation, we will have the formation of free BR2, or well, free BR radicals. Mm -hmm. So the BR2 molecule the bond in the BR2 molecule it will break it homolytically. So remember you have homolytic bond breaking and heterolytic bond breaking. So if in step one, we're going to break the BR bond. And remember in this mechanism, we use fish hook. So this is the only mechanism that we need to know that involves fish hook. All the other mechanisms that we do for Cape, they involve curved arrows. Remember now, every band, it has two electrons in it. But we don't actually put the electrons there, right? We just know that every single band, there are two electrons in it. So when the band breaks homolytically, each atom of the band will get one electron. Remember, we use fish hook. And how this works, the end of the fish hook is where the source of the electron is. And the end is pointing to where the electron is going. So one electron is going to this bromine atom. And the next electron is going to this bromine atom. So in, in homolytic, Band breaking, each atom of the band gets one electron. And remember, for this reaction to occur, you need UV light or sunlight. If each atom gets back the electron from the bond, then there cannot be any bond at the end of the process. So the two atoms are separated. And both of them as an unpaired electron. So these are your two bromine 
radicals. All right. So that is what happens in initiation. You are forming your free radicals. All right, I'm going to erase this at this point. I can move it a little longer. I'm going to erase it now. All right, this second step is initiation. Sorry, propagation. So in step two, we're going to have propagation. And in this step, we have the bromine radical. So the bromine molecule, sorry, the bromine radical is going to attack your ethane molecule to give you the ethyl radical. So in propagation, you will always have radicals. The bromine radical attacks the ethane molecule to form the ethyl radical. And then the ethyl radical attacks bromine molecule to form bromoethane. So the two key thing, the two key things that happen in propagation is that your bromine radical that was produced in step one attacks the alkane. So whichever alkane they give you, the radical will attack that alkane, right? And that alkane will be converted into a radical as well. So it's two steps. So in propagation, it's two steps. The first one, the bromine radical is going to attack your ethane. So this is step one of propagation.
Now, even though we use the word attack, all we're going to actually illustrate is to draw a fish hook over the plus sign, all right? So remember, the radical has one unpaired electron and any movement of a single electron, we use a fish hook. And remember, every single bond, every single bond has two electrons in it. Your carbon to hydrogen bond, it is going to break homolytically. It means that the hydrogen is taking its one electron. All right, so what this is showing here is that the hydrogen and the bromine radical is forming a bond. It takes two electrons to form a bond. The bromine radical as one and hydrogen is taking its electron from the bond with carbon and is now sharing it with bromine. So the two fish hooks pointing towards each other, that is a bond being being formed. When the fish hooks are going away from each other, the bond is being broken. So if you look at the carbon to hydrogen bond, the two fish hooks are going away from each other. So carbon gets one electron and the hydrogen takes its electron. Now on the product side, what will we show? Hydrogen and bromine are forming a bond. So at the end of the process, we should have a molecule of HBr. Carbon has one unpaired electron. Also, it lost the hydrogen. So on this side, we have two carbon atoms, right? But this one it no longer has three hydrogens. It has two hydrogens and an unpaired electron, all right? Hence you have the ethyl radical. I am looking at the comment section as well. So if you have any question, you can type it. So there we get the ethyl radical. So it doesn't matter which alkane I get in propagation, this is the first thing that will happen. Remove a, a hydrogen is removed from your alkane. All right. It is a radical because it has a single electron. So as was said, right, the ethyl radical will now attack the bromine molecule. You have to remember this, when this is actually occurring, right? It will occur in a container. So like you pour up some, so if you pour some liquid bromine, there will be a lot of Br2 molecules in the container, not just one. So there are a lot of bromine molecules. There are a lot of ethane molecules. There are several bromine radicals. So there are a lot of everything. So don't confuse a single step to represent the entire process. So when I say in step two that this radical is going to attack a bromine molecule, it's there are several bromine molecules present. All of them will not form a radical at the same time. And also, as you will see in termination, some of them is going to combine again. So the point is, just remember that a lot of Br2 molecules are in there, not just one. All right. So in, in our second step now, draw back. So that's our ethyl radical. And we are going to react it with a bromine molecule. This bond is going to break homolytically. Oh, 
So just like in step one, where the hydrogen and bromine formed a bond, and the bond between carbon and hydrogen was broken, your ethyl radical is forming a bond with this bromine. And so this bromine to bromine bond, it will be broken. And so as the product, let's look at what happened here. This carbon is forming a bond with this bromine atom. On the product side, we need Tocholder. So the bond is now formed between carbon and bromine. Wherever two are, wherever the fish hooks, the head of the fish hooks are pointing towards each other, that is a bond being formed. Here, they are going away from each other, that is a bond being broken. All right, so that's bromoethane plus a BR radical. What this means that is that propagation could continue again. So this bromine radical could attack this molecule again and remove a hydrogen. So it could continue until all of the hydrogen was re removed. But we're only required to show when one bromine is attached. So this is it for propagation. The third step is termination. So I'll give you a minute and just pick off this and then we'll continue. All right, let's continue again. All right, so if you are still writing, I'm going to erase. So just take a screenshot. Jada, wanted to ask something? All right, so now we're going to do termination. In termination, three radicals are going to combine. Oh, hi. All right, so three radicals combine. I remember the three radicals combine to form molecules.
So if you remember in initiation, we add bromine radical. And in propagation, we add an ethyl radical. So these are the two radicals that were produced in the process. So what are the possibilities? BR and BR can combine. Okay. To give BR2. Two ethyl radicals can combine and we would get butane. And finally, an ethyl radical can combine with a bromine radical. And so you will get bromoethane. And so that's the end of the process. Three steps, initiation, propagation, and termination. All right, I'm going to erase it at this point. So just take a screenshot. All right, so moving on now, it says identify the type of reaction mechanism outlined. So as we know, it was free radical substitution. All right, so it says compound Q is an acyclic hydrocarbon of molecular formula 
C4H8. The compound Q is C4H8. So we know that is butene. So it is asking us to draw structural formula of two isomers of Q. All right, so I'm going to put them to the side. All right, I can put one here. So we could draw one butene and we could draw two butene. When you're drawing alkenes, when you get to the double bond, ensure you don't put on too much hydrogens. So carbon always form four bonds. So if I put the next hydrogen here, that would be too much. It would be five. So two, three, four. I just ensure when you get to the double bond, you don't put too much hydrogen. Hence, I only have one hydrogen here. This is one butene and this is two butene. There's also a next one you could draw as well. And this is Two methyl, one propene. So C4H8, it has three isomers one butene, two butene, and two methyl, one propene. This is state where the compound Q exhibits geometric isomerism. Well, if it is 2-butene, if it is in the form of 2-butene, it can ex exhibit cis-trans isomerism. So, this one, one butene, does not have geometric isomerism. Two methyl propene, two methyl one propene, does not have geometric isomerism. All right, but two butene can be, can exhibit geometric isomerism. So this one can. All right, I think we can move on again.
All right, so state two reasons for your answer in C2. All right, so if you remember, with geometric isosomerism, right, it only occurs in alkene. All right, so let's say I have C2. For example, C2H2F2. Let me use. I don't put it. Right, so if you want to get geometric isomerism, it has to be an alkene. Now, both of the carbon atoms must have a group in common. So what do we need for geometric isomerism? Both carbon atoms of the carbon to carbon double bond must have an atom or group in common. All right. So the first thing that must happen is that both carbon atom atoms of the double bond must have a group in common. So for example, this carbon has fluorine, this carbon has fluorine. We could have also used the hydrogen as well. The second one, let me put it up here. So they must have a group in common, all right? Second thing you must look out for, no carbon atom, no carbon atom of the carbon to carbon double bond must have two, of the same atoms or groups attached. So both of them must have a group in common, but none of them must have the same group on it. So if you look at this compound, both of them have a group in common, but none of them have the same, two of this same group. What I mean by that, if this one had fluorine on it and this one had hydrogen on it, this could not exhibit geometric isomerism. Remember, to exhibit geometric isomerism, the two of the same atoms must be on the same side. All right, so let me put up a next point. So ensure you are taking off these points. So the, the reason why none of the carbon atoms of the double bond most of our group in common, the third point. Two of the same atom or group must be, must be, on opposite sides must be on opposite sides of the double bond in one compound. And on the same side,
in the next compound. All right. So I'm going to draw one butene. And in join your isomer, in join your cis trans isomer, you draw the double bond first, right? And then you set up your diagonal lines. Cool. So if you remember how oh, beauty looks, one, two, three, four. So this is what I'm going to draw. So that means these are the carbon atoms, right? So this must have a hydrogen, this must have a hydrogen. Here, I must have, so these are the two carbons of the double bond. This carbon has a hydrogen up here. And down here, it would be this bond. So it would be CH2, CH3, all right? This will not be able to exhibit cis-trans isomerism. Reason being, let me show you. Let's draw it back again. All right, I'm going to put this hydrogen here in blue. All right. I'm going to put these two hydrogens in blue. Let that stay in red. So what's up, what is supposed to happen, right? Technically, all right, let me put this in red. What is supposed to happen is that one of these hydrogens come up here and this one come down here. So let's say we put the blue down here or let's block. So the block would come up here and the blue come down here. Even though I am color coding it, you have to remember it is still hydrogen. So this begs the question, is there anything different between these two compounds? If you look at these two compounds, there's nothing different between them. You have two agents on this side of the other one. You have the same thing for this. So if you look at this rule here in blue, no carbon atom of the carbon to carbon double bond must have two of the same atoms in common. And the reason we are doing that, if they have something in common, then you cannot get this. So if this happens, you cannot get this, all right? So let's take a picture of this. Let me do two butene. So one butene is not a geometric isomer, all right? The reason why it is not a geometric isomer, it has two hydrogens and, this, and one carbon of the double bond. So because of the two hydrogens and the same carbon of the double bond, you can't have geometric isomerism. Just look back at the three rules I wrote, all right? Let's take a screenshot. All right, I'm going to erase this. Two butene on the other hand is a geometric isomer. Let's draw two butene.
All right, so focus on the carbons of the double bond. This one has a hydrogen and a methyl group. This one also has a hydrogen and a methyl group. If you look at rule one, all carbon atoms of the double bond must have a group in common. If you look at this, both carbons of the double bond has a group in common. We can use the methyl group or we could use the hydrogen. The next one, no carbon atom of the double bond must have two of the same groups attached. This carbon atom, it has a hydrogen and the methyl. There are two different groups. Remember in one butene, the carbon of the double bond, it had two hydrogens on it. This was in one butene. So it, it did not stick to this rule here, all right? So this would be cis. So clearly two of the same groups must be on opposite sides in one compound and on the same side in the next. They have two methyl groups on the same side in this compound. If we do it again, we can put the methyl groups on opposite sides, all right? So they are across from each other now. So that is trans. Right. So this chan, that is why compound Q can exhibit geometric isomerism. You should have written out these rules by now. So let me just move that. So there are two reasons for your answer in C2. It can exhibit geometric isomerism in view to E. All right, so that would be our answer for two marks. They have a, both carbon atoms of a group in common. We could have put that as well. All right, so you could have put that as well. So you could pick any of these two, all right? 
So that's that. Let's scroll down to the next question. All right, so it says outline the mechanism for the reaction of compound Q and HBr using curved arrows to show the movement of electrons. You're welcome. All right, so compound Q, if you want to use two butene, one butene, whichever one you're prefer, you can go ahead. All right, so this mechanism is between our alkene. So now this one is an alkene reaction. So no fish hooks in this one. So I'm going to use two butene, right? Let me use one butene. All right, so this is step one. Let's put it here, step one. All right, so first thing, HBr it is a polar molecule. So remember the bromine is much more electronegative than hydrogen. So because it is much more electronegative, the electrons are closer to bromine. It will have a slightly negative charge and the hydrogen will have a slightly positive charge. Now what you have to remember is that the double bond, when you have a double bond, it consists of a sigma bond and a pi bond. All right, so double bond consists of sigma and pi. This pi electrons now, these two pi electrons, they are going to form a bond with the hydrogen. Now, all I will do is draw a curved arrow from this, from the double bond to the hydrogen. The reason why I'm using a curved arrow, if you remember, fish hook is only used for one electron. Once you are transferring two electrons, that is, you should use a curved arrow. So, your double bond, it has a sigma and a pi. When the double bond is doing the attack, it is actually your pi electrons. So your pi bond, it has in two electrons. We are not interested in the sigma bond. So what we're actually doing is forming a dative covalent bond. Dative covalent bond. So if you remember in a dative covalent bond, one atom. So for example, this is an example of a dative covalent bond. One atom donates both of the electron to the next atom. So you get AB. All right, so this is dative covalent bonding. Regular covalent bonding would be something like this. 
right? A and B share electrons to give AB. So this is the regular covalent bonding. In dative covalent bonding, one atom donates two electrons. So we are showing the movement of two electrons from the double bond down to hydrogen, right? So it is forming a bond with hydrogen. If you are, once you are forming a bond, you must be breaking a next one. So if you are removing the hydrogen, this bond is going to be broken ethereolytically. Polar bonds, let me just add a little note here. Polar bonds, polar bonds are broken. Ethereolytically. The polar bonds are broken ethereolytically, which means that bromine will get two electrons. When it breaks ethereolytically, the electronegative atom, electronegative atom, I should say the more, the more electronegative atom gets both electrons. And so bromine is much more electronegative than hydrogen. So it gets both electrons. So that is why you see I draw a curved arrow from the bond to the bromine. I will need to erase this, so just take, take a screenshot. So in terms of annotating our mechanism, we have a nucleophilic attack on the HBr molecule by the pi electrons of the carbon to carbon double bond. And secondly, that will lead to the formation. So the main event of the first step is the formation of a carbocation. So the main event here is the formation of the carbocation. But to form the carbocation, we have to attack the HBr molecule. So how will it look now at the end of this process? So we have four carbons. You cannot have the double bond again. The double bond, it was used to bond with hydrogen. All right, so the next one, where will this hydrogen go? This carbon or this carbon? If you remember, oh, the non-polar bonds break homolytically. All right, so let me just add that quickly. Non-polar bonds break homolytically. Example, 
your CH bonds and like your halogens, BR, BR, CL, CL, all right? So non-polar bonds break homolytically. All right, you have to remember Markovnikov's rule. So Markovnikov's rule, when you're adding a hydrogen halide to an alkene, the hydrogen will go to the carbon of the double bond that has more hydrogen. So we're going to put this hydrogen on this carbon, all right? And we're going to put the positive sign here. And also the reason why that the sec this is a secondary carbocation and it is more stable than a primary carbocation. So the reaction actually proceeds through the formation of the more stable carbocation. This is primary, sorry, this is secondary carbocation. If the positive sign was on this, it would have been a primary. So secondary is more stable than the primary carbocation. So step one, we have the formation of our carbocation. I'm going to erase the annotation. Step two. Nucleophilic attack. Nucleophilic attack on the carbocation. Oh, up here, we should have the bromide ion. So when a bond breaks heterolytically, you always get electrophile electrophile and a nucleophile, nucleophile. So when bonds break homolytically, you will get radicals. When they break heterolytically, you get electrophile, which is the one with the positive charge and the nucleophile, the one with the negative charge. All right, so nucleophilic attack on the carbocation. So the carbocation, would be the electrophile. All right, so let us draw back butane or the carbocation for butane. So we have a positive charge here. We would have one of the hydrogens there. All right. So it's a nucleophile, which means, which means it has a lone pair of electrons. Right. Just remember to draw a curved arrow. All right, so these two electrons are being donated to carbon. So if a nucleophilic attack were forming a dative covalent bond, At the end of this process, we should end up with Br attached to this carbon. So this mechanism is rather simple, just two steps. We form the carbocation and the bromide ion comes in step two and attack it. All right, so this is two bromo more and there of it.
All right, I'm going to erase this screen. Right, the type of mechanism is electrophilic addition. As we're adding the electrophile, which is the H plus. So electrophilic addition. All right, so this question now, it says, describe observations expected for each of the following. Right, it's also called that as well. And that was our reply. I'm just answering someone in the comment section. All right, so expected observations. All right, so aqueous bromine is added to liquid venting in sunlight. So remember, if you if you remember when I was doing the mechanism, I had, I had written UV light of the arrow. That is because the reaction will not take place without it. So UV light or sunlight. So the fact that they put in sunlight tells you that the reaction will occur. So aqueous bromine, so pentane, so bromine will be decolorized. The bromine will be decolorized when added. So what will be pentane? Or you can put orange, it will change from orange to colorless. So alternatively, it will change from orange to colorless, whichever one you want to put. So if you want to say it will be decolorized, or if you want to say it changed from orange to colorless. And if you notice down here now, it is added without sunlight. So just put no, all right, so. You can put no visible. visible reaction will occur. And then this one called acidified potassium per manganate is added to liquid pentane. Same thing, no visible reaction. You see it's pentane or pentane, pentane. So it does not react with the alkane.
I'm not sure why this is where it two marks. As it is, it will not react with the alkane, so you won't see anything occurring. All right, we're going to move on again. Oh, by the way, let me just scroll back up a little. Reaction, it asks for a mechanism, know the names of the mechanism separate from the reactions, All right? So reaction and mechanism is not the same. Right, so let's continue. So for example, when we're in this one, the addition of bromine to pentane is halogenation. All right, let's move a little quicker. All right, so the compound will, all right, so they're showing the compound, it reacts with aqueous sodium hydroxide to produce ethanol. Name the starting compound. All right, so they are giving us an alkane. They're asking us to name it. All right, so let me quickly draw it. That is CH3. So we have two CH3 groups there. So what they have CH3 in bracket under two, then they have CH. So it should be written like that. Afterwards, you have a carbon with BR. So that is C, CHC, BR, right? After BR, you have CH3 in a bracket. So that means it is a substituent, it is a methyl group. After that methyl group, you have CH2, CH2, CH3. So CH2. CH2. The reaction, just re re replying to a comment, the reaction with the potassium permanganate, it's for alkenes and alcohol, it's oxidation. The alkane, it will not be oxidized. So potassium permanganate and dichromate that reacts with alkene and alcohol. All right, so this is the compound and they ask us to name it. So let's check how many carbons we have. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the longest chain, it has six carbons. Right? So if it has six carbons, we know it is hexane. Right? We have a, a methyl group on carbons two, and the next one on carbon three, and we have a bromine group. So we have to list them in alphabetical order. So it would be two bromo, two, three, 
dimethyl hexane. Right? So bromine is on carbon two, and we have two methyl groups. That is why we say dimethyl, and they are on carbons two and three. So that is the name of this compound. So the type of reaction which takes place when compound, when this compound reacts with sodium hydroxide. So the type of reaction, it is nuclear silic substitution. So ala alkanes, they undergo nucleophilic substitution. Now, this one, it will, if you remember nucleophilic substitution, it can be SN1. Um, by the way, that was 2019. No, we, we finished with 2021. This is 2019. So all of what we did a while ago, that was 2021. So this now is 2019. All right, so remember with nucleophilic substitution, it can be SN1 and it can be SN2. You have to know the type of carbocation that we have in order to know if it is SN1 or SN2. For this specific one, it will be SN1. So nucleophilic substitution, specifically SN1. How did I know that? Look at the bond between the carbon and the halogen, all right? So that's the carbon to halogen bond. Look how many carbons are touching this carbon that is attached to bromine. This carbon is touching it, this is touching it, and this carbon. So three carbons are directly in contact with the carbon atom attached to bromine. That is why it is a tertiary alkene, right? So three carbons are directly touching it, that is tertiary. Secondary. This would be an example of secondary. In this example, two carbons are bonded to the carbon with the halogen, right? So when two carbons are bonded, it is secondary. Three carbons, that is tertiary. And if it was one carbon that was in contact with the halogen, then it would be primary. So this carbon here is bonded to the halogen. Hydrogen, hydrogen, so only one carbon. So only one carbon is directly in contact with the carbon that is bonded to bromine. So that is primary, that is secondary, and that is tertiary. All right, let's move on. Just take a screenshot if you need to. Right, and it says outline the mechanism for the reaction used in using curved arrows and fish hooks. Show clearly the structure of any intermediate form. All right, the is structure already. All right, I'm just going to use a portion of it to show the reaction. I remember there was a methyl group and the carbon with bromine. So 
So step one, this is a two step process. Step one, formation of a carbocation. The reason why we are going to get a carbocation is that the carbon to bromine bond will break carbon to bromine bond will break theoretically all right i remember when a bond breaks heterolytically, when a bond breaks heterolytically, you always get electrophile and nucleophile. All right, so I'm just going to use a portion of the molecule. All right, so as I said, the first thing that will happen, the carbon to bromine bond breaks heterolytically. And so we will end up with a carbocation. Plus the bromide ion. That's your electrophile, this is your nucleophile. So step one, form the carbocation. The carbon to halogen bond breaks heterolytically. And then in step two now, you will have nucleophilic attack and the carbocation. Nucleophilic attack and the carbocation. So let me just drop up the carbocation. Wait, lies, hold on. Not BR, sorry. Nucleophilic attack on the carbocation by the hydroxide ion. So in this, in this mechanism, the hydroxide ion, so once you see you're using sodium hydroxide, and that is the nucleophile that they ask us to use for right? the hydroxide ion. So in the question, yes, our sodium hydroxide, I think it said that. Let me just scroll back up. Where was it? Right, sodium hydroxide. So it is the hydroxide ion of sodium hydroxide that will act as the nucleophile. So not the bromide ion. And the negative charge is actually on the oxygen. And so that is why you would end up with an alcohol. Right. So you can get an alcohol from an L alkane by reacting with by reacting it with sodium hydroxide. And so that's the mechanism. Two steps from the carbocation and use OH to attack it. All right, moving on again.
All right, that was it for 2019 in terms of the types of question I'm answering today. I think the rest of it was on benzene and so forth. So this is part one of part three. So in the next at the next time, we will look at the ones with benzene and so forth. All right, three characteristics of a whole molecular series. Right, let me just answer that. So they should have the same general formula, same functional group, similar chemical properties. Just take a screen shut, shut off that. I'm going to scroll down. All right, so this one, we're going to work out empirical and molecular formula. All right, so on analysis, one gram of compound A containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen provided 0.4 gram of carbon and 0.5 gram of oxygen. Compound A has a molecular mass of 60 and effervescent and effervescence regularly with calcium carbonate. So that's telling us it is an acid. All right. Okay, the empirical formula of compound A. So it contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Mass of carbon is 0 0.4. Mass of oxygen is 0 0.54. Hydrogen, the mass of hydrogen is equal to, so they are using one gram of a compound. So it would be one take away the mass of carbon plus hydrogen. And you will get the calculated to be 0 0.06. That is 0 0.06, all right? So the first thing we need is the mass of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So we're going to work out the moles. And as we know, mole is equal to mass over the relative atomic mass of the element. Carbon is 12, hydrogen is one, oxygen is 16. We will end up with 0 0.03. 0 0.06 and 0 0.03. Then we're going to divide by this the smallest number, which is 0 0.03. And so I'm going to get for the divide that it will be equal to one. This is equal to two, and this is equal to one. So the empirical formula, it is CH2O, right? To get the molecular formula, we're going to calculate N. N is the molar mass of the compound, molar mass of the compound, divided by the empirical formula mass. So 
So in the question, the molar mass of the compound is 60. The empirical formula is CH2O. Carbon is 12 of two hydrogens, that's a total of two. And oxygen is 16. That will give you 30. So the empirical formula mass, that is 30. That means N is equal to two. What you are going to do now to get the molecular formula, you are going to multiply the empirical formula by whatever two is, by whatever N is. So, so N is two, you multiply the empirical formula by two. So that is C2H4O2. And so this is the molecular formula. So EF is CH and the molecular formula is C2H4 and that's three marks. I take a picture or a screenshot. I'm going to erase it. Right, the general formula for the whole molecular series to which compound A belong, CNH2N plus one COOH. All right, draw the structural formula for the chloral substituted compound of A. So A would have been let me just put back up. Right here. Yeah. Compound A would have been ethanoic acid. So it says draw the structural formula of the chloral substituted compound of A. So you just replace one of these hydrogens with chlorine. Continuing. All right, describe a simple laboratory test to distinguish between each of the following. So this is a primary alcohol. This is, a, looks like secondary alcohol. So remember I have three types of alcohol, primary, secondary and tertiary. Ethanol is a primary alcohol. So remember quickly, the carbon to which the OH group is attached. I am going to do it in terms of hydrogen. You can do it in terms of carbon. So just like with the, it's just like with the ala alkane. So the carbon with the OH group, how many carbons are attached to it? If one carbon is attached, it is primary. 
So in this example, one carbon is attached to the carbon with the OH group. So it is primary. So one carbon, primary. In terms of hydrogen, if two hydrogens are attached, it is primary alcohol. So you can do you can look at it in terms of carbon or in terms of hydrogen. Now, if one carbon, sorry, if two carbons are attached, then it is secondary alcohol. So clearly two carbons are directly attached. So two carbons, it is secondary. In terms of hydrogen, one hydrogen makes it secondary. And tertiary would be three carbons. So if three carbons are attached to the carbon with the OH, it is tertiary. All right. So three carbons, tertiary, are zero hydrogen. So if you don't see any hydrogen, no hydrogens on it, that makes it tertiary. So you can look at it in terms of hydrogen or in terms of carbon. All right, with that said, let us answer the actual question. So ethanol is a primary alcohol. And if I should draw out this structure of this compound here, CH2 and CH3, CH, OH, CH3. So clearly, this is a secondary alcohol because one hydrogen is attached to it. Or in terms of carbon, two carbons. So we have a primary alcohol and a secondary alcohol. Now, primary and secondary alcohols, they are oxidized by potassium dichromate, potassium permanganate, both of them. So we cannot use potassium permanganate or potassium dichromate. Oh, this was not ethanol. This was propanol. So you would use, you would do the iodoform test. All right. And the main reagent for this is NaOH and iodine. So if you want to distinguish primary and secondary, you can use the iodoform test. Don't understand how you get primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohol? How quickly? I want to know how, how we get the secondary, primary, and tertiary alcohol. All right, I'm going to have to continue. All right, so you, you will do the iodoform test. All right, that's when it's primary and secondary. If it was primary and tertiary, you could use potassium permanganate or potassium dichromate. So remember now, tertiary alcohols are not oxidized. All right, tertiary alcohols are not oxidized. So 
tertiary alcohols are not oxidized. Good. But because primary and secondary alcohols are oxidized, that is why you cannot use potassium permanganate or potassium dichromate, right? With the iodoform test, or I should mention, with the iodoform test, primary alcohol will not do it. Primary alcohol will not do it except ethanol. Primary alcohol will not do the iodoform test. Right? And the exception is ethanol. Right? Now this down here is an alkane, no lie. This is benzene and this is an alkene. So benzene and alkenes, they do not carry out the same reaction, all right? So all you need to do is just add some bromine. So you can use bromine water. You can use bromine water. You could also use KMNO4, all right? Benzene will not react with your bromine without a catalyst. So in the next session, when we do benzene, you will realize why it would not work, all right? So your procedure, you just use the alkene or use your bromine. So you just add the bromine to each compound, right? Of course, the alkene will decolorize it. No visible reaction will occur with bromine. You have to know all your reagents so you know when to do what, right? So organic chem is not difficult unless you make it, meaning you have to, do, you have to study consistently. You have to remember all of your reagents, all of them, for each homologous series. All right. Person that said they did not understand, there's a video on the channel on alcohol. I just send an email or something. I'll try to explain it outside of class. All right. We're going over time. Let me see. Let me do one more question. All right. We basically did this a while ago, right? So different primary, secondary, and tertiary as applied to alcohols. Give relevant examples. I just did that. Let me put it again. So ethanol would be a primary alcohol.
So you would repeat this statement again, right? Secondary as it relates to alcohol. So I'm just going to start it right here. Refers to. All right, take a picture of that. Moving on. And for tertiary, you would just re re replace two with three. So refers to an alcohol in which three carbon atoms. You just replace two with three. Yes, this is our final question on how much you Right, so let's get through this paper quickly. All right, what do we do up here? Yes. So we finished there. This is 20, we're on to 2017, by the way. So we are done, 20, so we're doing 2017. All right, so this one now. So two isomeric phenyl alcohols and three, with sulfuric acid produce compound D. So two isomeric alcohols produce compound D, which decolorized solution of bromine in organic solvent. Oxidation of the isomers with acidified potassium permanganate produce compounds E and F which gave yellow precipitate with 2,4 DNP. However, on the compound F formed a silver mirror with a solution of silver nitrate. This is why you need to know all your reagents and the different reactions, so you know how to apply them, all right? So once you have an alcohol and the treated with concentrated sulfuric acid, right? You are dehydrating the alcohol. So that's the first thing. So right here on treatment with sulfuric acid, we are dehydrating the alcohol. That means compound D is an alkene. Okay. So they said A and B are alcohol. You react it with sulfuric acid. You are dehydrating the alcohol, which means you have an alkene. And it makes sense because it says compound D decolorize a solution of bromine. And we know that alkenes are separate from alkane. We the next homologous series that does that reaction is alkene. So the alkene decolorizes bromine water. So compound D is an alkene, all right? Then now it says oxidation of the isomers with acidified potassium permanganate produced compounds E and F. So oxidation of alcohols 
tertiary alcohols are not oxidized. Primary alcohol will give carboxylic acid. So primary alcohols are oxidized to carboxylic acid. Secondary alcohols will give you a ketone. Tertiary alcohols not oxidized. All right. So oxidation of the isomers, meaning isomer A and B, uh, oxidation of them with potassium per manganate produce compounds E and F. So because both of them were oxidized, tell us that none of the isomer is a, is a tertiary alcohol. Neither of the isomer is a tertiary alcohol because both of them were oxidized by potassium dichromate. Now we get two compounds, E and F. So they could be carboxylic acids, aldehyde, by the way, before you get to the carboxylic acid, primary alcohols are oxidized to aldehydes. And if allowed, they can go to carboxylic acid. So secondary alcohol will only give a ketone, but the primary alcohol is oxidized to aldehyde. And if allowed, it will be further oxidized to a carboxylic acid. Now it says that, which gave yellow precipitate with 2,4-DHP. The fact that it gave, both of them give a precipitate with 2,4-DNP means that we do not have carboxylic acid. 2,4-DNP is a reagent for carbonyl compounds, aldehydes and ketones, all right? So we know that both of them, E and F, must be a carbonyl compound. Then it says, however, compound F formed a silver mirror with a solution of, however, only, so only compound F, only compound F formed a silver mirror. That tells me compound F is an aldehyde. So compound F is an aldehyde. Compound E is a ketone. Reason being, Ketones do not react. They do not do the silver mirror test, but aldehydes do. So F from the silver mirror, making F the aldehyde and E the ketone, all right? And so E and F, so we know what E and F is and we know what D is, all right? So, Type of react, steady type of reaction which produce compound D. All right, so we know the type of reaction is dehydration. And so let me just write them on the board now. All right. So I said F, F was the aldehyde, uh, E, the key one. All right, so let me just move that. So we know this is dehydration, all right, so that's that. There are the structural formula of compound D, all right, how much? That's look like eight carbons. It's a phenyl alcohol, which means that six carbon is in the ring, all right? So that's C6, and it's a phenyl alcohol, so we have two additional hydrogens, two additional carbons, all right? Now, one of them must be primary and one must be secondary. So it says draw the structural formula of compound D. Well, you can draw any of the isomers. Two isomeric female alcohols. All right. Oh, draw the structure of compound D. All right, hold on.
All right. So this is one of the isomers, all right? For compound D, it must be an alkene. So if I dehydrate this compound, I'm going to convert it into an alkene. By doing this, all right? So that is compound D. Right, that's compound D, alkene. Compound, a possible structure for compound A would have been this. Let me just draw it here. All right, so when you dehydrate this, you would get the alkene, which is compound D. All right. Explain the reaction which led to the production of compounds E and F. Explain the reaction led to compound E and F. All right. E and F are aldehyde. E and E is the ketone, F is the aldehyde. E and F are ketone, or is a ketone, E and F is a ketone on a node meter. I'm going to erase this. The live is saved. If you miss anything, you can just look back at it and write it off. And so E, the ketone, and F is an aldehyde. Put compound in front of E and F. The compound E is a ketone, compound F is an aldehyde. Oxidation of a primary alcohol. leads to the formation of an aldehyde and oxidation of a secondary alcohol. Leads to the formation of the All right, moving on again. Just take a picture if you need to. All right, so it asks, deduce the structural formula for E and F and A and B. So we said E is a ketone. E is a ketone. 
that means that double bond must be here. All right. That's the key to one. So this is E. And if F is the aldehyde, double bond O must be there. So that's F. Components A and B, all right. Let's see if that was the last question. Comment on the reaction of A and B to play in polarized light, all right. All right, compound A. All right, one must be a primary alcohol and one must be a secondary alcohol. All right, so that's the secondary alcohol. All right. and this would be the primary alcohol. Right. I need to look which one of them gave you A and which one give you F in order to know which I should put as A and B. So let me just look at the question. All right, oxidation of the isomers with acidified potassium dichromate produce E and F. Oh, it just say oxidation of the isomers produce E and F. It doesn't matter which one to put as A and B. Right? So you just need to have one of them being A and one of them being B. We can make one A and the next one B. All right. Now, comment, they ask us to comment on the reaction of A and B to play in polarized light. Basically, they want to know if any of them is chiral. All right. So do we have any chiral carbon? A chiral carbon is a carbon with four different things attached to it. So this carbon has four different groups attached to it. I'm right. gonna make it so simple. Right. This is a chiral carbon because it has fluorine, methyl, fluorine. All of this is a group. So it has four different groups. So it is chiral. Chiral compounds will rotate plane polarized light. So when it says comment on the action of A and B, comment on the action of A and B to play in polarized light, tell if it will rotate it or not and why. So looking at this carbon, I know this will be a chiral carbon. This is one group. This is a next group. The ring is also a group. And the hydrogen is a group. If you need to revisit isomerism, there's a just again, just go in the playlist, there's a video on isomerism. One for structural and one for stereo isomerism. So if you if you don't understand this, just check that video and you will see it. All right. So these are four different groups. So compound A is chiral. This carbon has two of the same groups attached to it. This carbon has two of the same group attached to it. 
it is not chiral. So this is my compound B, it is not chiral. This is my compound A, it is chiral. Right? So just take a picture of that. I'm going to move on. So the final question is to comment on it. So let me just put it up at the top. So all I would say, compound A, compound A is chiral, hence it will rotate the plane of polarized light. And compound B is not curl, so it will not rotate the plane of polarized light. And that's it for this session. Hope it was helpful for you. Whenever I'm going to do a next one, I will post it in the post it on the someday. It's I will post it on the channel. So if you're subscribed to my channel, just ensure you press the notification bell. So when I do anything, you will be notified of it. All right, so this is where I'm going to end this session. Have a good day. All right.